Our big guest tonight is ready to get stuck into the wall. Let's get him out right now. He's the Republic of Ireland's second highest goal scorer of all time, who went on to become the first Irish chairman in the Premier League. Ladies and gentlemen, Niall Quinn. <laughs> Thanks for coming along. No, pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You are a massive GA man. You also work for Sky Sports. Yes. Uh, do you understand the massive reaction to that story this week before we crack on with the rest of this? Yes, I do. And I understand from the old school thinking, my father is, is worried about it and other GA people are worried about it. And I saw it here tonight. But there's a couple of things I, I would add to what's been spoken about already to hear. One would be Sky didn't tell the football clubs to go crazy and give all the players the money. That was something the clubs did all by themselves. Sky put the money on the table and have created an incredible product and the, and the Premier League worldwide is, is phenomenal. And I see the second thing I would like to say, you know, is as, long, and as long as that money is handled properly, if it does get bigger down the line, then that's great. And, and it, I take Desi's point that does some of it work its way to the players or, or how, does it, how does it manifest out? That's a big mm. issue that has to be dealt with and I don't know the answer to that. But I suppose the, the, the feeling I have when, when I look at it and I think about what it could do for non-Irish people abroad and how big we could make the game overseas with people who haven't got you know, Irish relations and stuff. And I, I listened to a fantastic uh, show on the radio there just before Christmas. It came from Scandinavia and it was about a ladies football team in Scandinavia and they were all nowhere near Irish. There was, you know, there's only two or three of them had Irish connections but they were friends of Irish people <coughs> and they loved the game. And, and the last little thing I'll tell you, during the, the takeover at Sunderland, uh, uh, sorry, when, when Drummerville were, were moving on and Ellis Short was coming in, we had quite a long protracted weekend at one stage. And we all just upped and came back to Ireland to the All-Ireland semi-final. And the, the main lawyer of Ellis Short came around and said, he should be buying Dublin, not buying Sunderland. <laughs> and I don't mean Dublin as a city, I mean the G18. <laughs> and, and it was just, you know, I would love, I've been harping on about it over in England for 30 years now. And I would love English people, foreign people, to get it. And I think if we could turn that, I think that's probably the, the I, I'd imagine that's what the GA are trying to do here. And yeah. uh, if we could do that and, and show this great game around the world, it would be fantastic. Now, in 2002, your autobiography came out and you were at the end of your playing career then. You made the point in it that you, you'd like to walk away. Football is somebody else's business at that stage. Now, a few years later, you're back as a chairman. A very different kind of environment in the boardroom compared to on the pitch. Did that experience as Sunderland chairman change you as a person? Yes, I think I was very much a footballer who was trying to pretend not to be. And I think what happened overnight, I suppose, I left football in a huff because Harold Wilkinson came to Sunderland. I didn't like the way he, he treated everybody for the first day or two. I felt I was not his person. Very quickly he made sure that I wasn't. I didn't even train with the kids. Normally you're banished with the kids, but I was sent to train with the injured players. And uh, you kind of know you're, you're in a bit of trouble <laughs> not there. Not a great sign. <laughs> and uh, I came home, packed my bags up and said, come on, love, we're, we're, we're moving everybody back to Ireland. I've, I've had enough of this now. I've done my time. And, and I didn't stop to think about it. I hadn't put a uh, good planning process in place for my retirement. And I came home and it was great. I played golf for about six weeks and everybody was lovely to me. I'd had a good career. And then the world started to unravel a little bit strangely for me. And I eventually picked myself up and got going and did a little bit of TV work with Sky at that time. And then I, I got my energy again and I wanted to do, to do big things. And, and thankfully, the Drummerville guys were, were, were right behind me when, when the opportunity came to do something. Did you have to be very different, though, to how you had been? The, the portrayal, maybe it's a caricature of you over yeah. the years, was this Mother Teresa type, uh, very nice person. <laughs> was, was, did you have to become more ruthless when you were in that kind of world? I think you, you'd need to know me a lot better than perhaps the character that, that would have come out at that time. I knew I had a serious job to do and it rubber stamped itself into, into my makeup. The day we took over Sunderland and the day I fielded the press questions and everybody was giving us a fair crack of the whip and I knew the, the media were with us, I knew everybody wanted us, we were doing it for the right reasons. And then the, the local paper in Sunderland, the Sunderland Echo, the front page, had a picture of the 17 previous chairman of the club since its inception, over 120, 30 years previous. And the big question mark with a picture of me was, can this man deliver? 
And that was the moment I realised I was no longer a footballer. And, and I enjoyed my time. I think the agents will tell you I gave a couple of them you know, far more than they had, they had bargained for. And I met the people who thought I was a soft touch too, but I just had to get quite clever with, with how I did the deals or how I uh, did the sponsorship deals. Or, you know, but there was always something. See, th this was the thing. I never sat back to think about how I was doing, about how I could do it different. It was a whirlwind. You know, you, you'd players, obviously, it can be a big problem. Uh, the most important part of the, of the whole thing. They're agents. You know, you have sponsors. The crowd, the fans themselves, you, you, you know, you're, you're punters. Uh, the owners, banks, it just went on and on. There was something every day. And, and I felt after five or six years, you know, that I'd, I'd learned an awful lot from it. I felt I'd given, I'd run my race in many respects. My messages were getting a little bit tired with the Sunderland people and I felt I, I'd done what I'd had to do. But I then thought I could then go and put that into an, another world. So I, so I, I go on again and, and um, literally overnight form my own business here in Ireland. And, and that, you know, is the real, that's, there's no cameras there, there's nobody patting you on the back and, or somebody else isn't scoring the goals for you. And I realised, you know, very quickly, I suppose, that your, your past and what people think of you counts for nothing, really. It's about how you jump out of bed every day, how you deal with situations, good, bad or indifferent. I had it lovely for a long time. People say nice things about me. People say something bad about me. I'd go into a rage and huff like every other player, you know, like they do now with me when I have a go at them on TV. The, the, your past, though, has, has enabled you to see the football system from sure. pretty much every different angle, you know, as a player, as a, as a chairman. Um, uh, you know, we've seen some Champions League games tonight. No Irish players involved. They're now absent from the top level of the game. There seems yeah. to be a, a consensus that our football system in this country has got some serious problems. I, I suppose the best way to describe that is I got through our system somehow. Uh, I only had Irish, Northern Irish, Scottish and Welsh and English players to beat to get myself into the system and become a footballer. And that's the way it was for a long time. And like, you know, the people might realise this, but when our Irish team were going well, John Aldridge was the Luis Suarez of the day at Liverpool and they were winning things and he was scoring as many goals as Luis Suarez. So we had that, that lovely avenue into the top uh, clubs in, in Britain and for me what's changed and, and dramatically in the last 10 12 years is you know an Irish player going over now as a young lad to try and, and break, break down the barriers get there as a top player you're playing against Africans every day Europeans from every country Americans Koreans it's, it's the whole world so, so the, the ante is really really higher now and it's it's so important I think that we look and see what can we do different that would have us have two or three players in those top clubs again. Well, why are they not there now? Well, my feeling is the old system that we have here of a player showing promise at 13, 14, 15, gone at 16, I think that's for the birds now. I really do. And I'm, sit I'm sitting here as somebody, and I'm sure there'll be one or two parents of players who came over to Sunderland under my tenure, saying, well, my son went over. And, and I feel really guilty at the stage about it because I think we should prepare not just really good footballers here through our emerging talent programmes of the FAI, etc., we should prepare young men, not boys, which is what's happened over a period of time. So you feel, you said you feel guilty there. As mm -hmm. Sunderland chairman, you'd be in the kitchens and the living rooms yeah. of Irish parents, selling them a dream of what could happen for their kids over there, sure. but knowing that that dream often no, won't happen for them? For, for, for I suppose that the numbers are seven, eight out of ten, will have no career, one or two will have a career of sorts, and one might just go and, and, and get there. And it's difficult. How can you turn down the chance for a young lad to go off and play? I mean, my mother was a teacher, wanted me to finish my education. I was out the door. As soon as Arsenal had come in for me, I was gone. There was no stopping me, and, and we can be like that. Now, you know, I just think sometimes, uh, well, not even sometimes, definitely, over the, over the years, that type of player and that type of attitude is diminishing our chances of getting our players to the very now, top. Now, is there a... a technique in that you were went over to Arsenal, their manager Terry Neal at the time came over and had the same chat that you had as Sunderland yes. chairman with younger kids in the last few years. Alex Ferguson always talks about you go for the mother. You talk to the mother and you'll yeah. be fine. <laughs> a father would be happier just to send the kid over to play football. Is that how it was? The, the way I always saw it was the mother was always the one worried about education, worried about the future and the father generally was my son's going to make it. You know, and, and that's, that's the way it probably is in most households because they're the more sporty, they're the ones who go to the pub and watch the games with their mates and they're saying, my son is off now, it's going to be great, whereas the mother tries to be cautious. And, yeah, I would have, I would have um, you know, dealt with, with parents and tried my best to put an education process in place. Uh, and I, I, 
please say one or two people now that didn't get through it and, and eventually went back on the education system have got themselves going. I've met uh, a couple of people over, over the last little while. Niall McArdle was a guy who, who played at Sunderland who was a really brainy guy. And looking back, I feel bad now about taking him out of this, this um, I suppose, pathway to, to you know, academia. And he ends up, you know, and he wasn't. So the other point is what he was a big, strong lad. He was as tall as me. I had ideas that he was going to be a bit like me. Uh, so he needed another three years yeah. to mature. Well, you, you might know? have mistaken for a man at the time, but he wasn't. But you talk, you talk about producing men. I mean, it sounds good, but what does that actually mean? I, I think it's, uh, it's been strong character-wise to go over to a country to take on the Africans, to take on the Europeans, and to take on all the other people who will be at your club. And I think the preparation nowadays is more than just our, our, our skills, our, our passing, our, our ability. It's about having the head to become a footballer. And the example I point to where it happens, and happens very successfully, is Belgium. It's okay. no surprise that Belgium have plenty of players playing in the top clubs. Do you encounter uh, their players? It's down to the way their academies think. They think that uh, the, the, I suppose the training of the brain to cope and to deal with situations is as important as the training of taking free kicks. And we, we've got to learn from that. And also, it's kind of unheard of for a Belgian parent, mother or father, to let their son go off to England at 16. You know, that, that, that just doesn't cope with them. And I'll give you, I'll give you one, of, one of the, the classiest examples I can tell you. Simon Mignolet looks as if he may win a, a Premiership title this year, and good luck to him. Um, we had the choice of buying him or a goalkeeper from the League of Ireland, and they were both the same age. And I, I would always have a leaning to the League of Ireland, and I paid the most money anybody ever did when we bought Roy O'Donovan from Cork. So I, I was always ha happy to promote, and, and David Myler and people like that came to James McLean. So, you know, I, I looked at the situation, and this, this kid came from Belgium. He came to meet us. We met his agent. We paid a million pounds for him, which would have smashed the record in the League of Ireland, just over a million, actually. But it was more the way he impressed us. He wanted to speak about... His agent was speaking about money, about different things. He wanted to speak about his education, and in the lifetime of his contract, what time would they guarantee, would we guarantee him to fulfil his studies? And I just looked at that and thought... Could we ever see the time when a 16-year-old Irish kid goes over mm. and says that around the table? And I, I don't think, and I mean, we have to try and aim for that. Yeah, well, if we have to try, try and aim for it, do you see, with the skill set that you have and the experience that you have, any role for yourself in that within Irish football? You're back based No, no, no the, asso the association, uh, I think, does a remarkable job in, in many, many ways. And they've, they've, under John Delaney's tutorage, and Packy Bonner was there for many times in as well, they've, they've got... I suppose a system in place now, and they've brought in Dutch training, which, which is you know the, that Dutch mentality, the, the old Ajax mentality, and young players will get excellent training in the emerging talent programs and in the elite player programs. They will get excellent football training. I just want to see if they can stop them going for another couple of years, and can academia-styled mentors come in and you know stop the players from going, or at, at the very least have a position where their education is sacrosanct when it comes to... And can you to get involved in that, do you think? Uh, I don't know. I, 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 the FBI I, ever asked you to? No, the FBI have never asked me to, no. I, I, it's not on their agenda. And they, look, they have some big things happening and they're, they're doing, pouring lots of, of time, effort, money into, into helping these kids along. But it's just that thing. Why do the English clubs, like me when I was chairman, why do we think we can snatch Irish kids at 16? It does sound like a bleak enough picture you paint. You've got mm -hmm. a teenage son. If he wanted to go over at 16 years of age... I wouldn't let him. Would you? You wouldn't let him? No. And we've, we've actually discussed that he's quite a, a, a decent goalkeeper when, he, when he's not, you know, he's doing every sport. He was like me as a youngster. And, um, you know, I, I'd rather than get him elite training and push him through the, through the whole barriers. I just want him to work it out through his education. And if he, at 18, 19, he's quite a big strap fella, if it starts to happen for him then, then I, I would be delighted for him. And, and, you know, and that doesn't have to, it could, it could be League of Ireland level, it could be whatever level. But to, to think that we judge somebody at 16 and we sort of hang drawn and quartered by the time they're 17, 18. That's what we do with probably 60, 70 percent of our young kids who go over. And, and it just doesn't sit well with me having been through that system. I, I presume he's taken that conversation well anyway. That, <laughs> well, it, it, he tells his mates that's why he hasn't gone to England. <laughs> <laughs> There's no win. You've been absolutely real. No win, everybody. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to seeing what you do with the good wall here. So we'll stand up and have a look. Murph, the top ten Irish sports people of all time, as it stands the moment before. You can stay here, though. Stay here. Yeah, oh, he'll yeah. do. Yeah, okay. he'll do the donkey. Okay. Top okay. three positions, uh, Dennis Taylor, yeah. number ten, then Paulie O'Shea is nine. Barry McGuigan, Katie Taylor, busted back down there from last week, and Peter Canavan. Shefflin, Porter Carrington, Sonia O'Sullivan, top three, then Roy Keane, A.P. McCoy, and uh, Brian O'Driscoll. All right, who are we adding to that top ten? Well, I 
just couldn't believe when you sent me the 10 that were on it that Paul McGrath wasn't on the list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Paul reminds me in many ways of, of Brian O'Driscoll and that, okay, so, so the Irish people love him, of course they love him, but when your dressing room loves you unanimously and, and when the other players respect you unanimously and to have the whole set of, of I suppose, your, your peers absolutely in awe was, was that Was that a personality thing or was it his skills? Everything. Like, he, he, it was more or less the way he could play the game and the way he was off the pitch, obviously, of course, but uh, which wasn't always easy. You know, he, 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 Paul um, was, was probably, you know, a great, great mentor for someone for me to have. Uh, and then you'd go out with him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so then it wasn't so good. But what I, what I love about Paul is Paul, Paul isn't famous. For, uh, one of the most famous games he played was for stopping Baggio. They said he was a great job he did, but he didn't do it by being a hard man. He did it by being quicker than Baggio, more skillful than Baggio, having a better brain than Baggio, and just being an all-round better footballer. All right, well, he's in so. on the wall. What number do you want to slot him in there? Well, on the basis that um, I think all sports should be treated equally and we shouldn't have one from or two from any sports, I'd stick him in at number three there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> Your 10-year... Well, more than 10-year work relationship with Roy Keane... Well, not standing in. But, the I, but I like Dennis Taylor as well. <laughs> <laughs> right then, well, you've got one more chance to. You can bring Keno back if you want. Doesn't sound like you're going to. Your <laughs> last switch this one. And, and I, I can switch somebody around. Yeah, yeah. Well, for those switching. who don't remember, and it, and it got a little bit of stick, but the largest audience ever on British TV was to see Dennis Taylor beat Steve Davis off the black. I don't know if anybody here saw that. I watched it in an English snooker hall with a load of Cockney spivs, <laughs> and I felt so proud to be Irish that night. So. I'm going to move him up a little bit, despite right. the, the, okay. the, the stick that he got tonight. <laughs> and oh, geez, I better go. Sonia's from Cork. I better go easy. <laughs> <laughs> He's going down. To and I think one of his uh, provincial sporting brother and brothers, I should say, maybe Barry McGuigan. Barry, okay. for Ooh, Barry. Two down to number ten. Okay, well, listen, Niall, Master, you're great. The crowd, not too happy with that last move there, but <laughs> thanks so much for all that. Murph, I can't help but notice how comfortable Niall seems to be in this mm. environment tonight. The good wall has just rejected yes, his uh, suggestions here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm uh, sure you're not too surprised at how relaxed our big guest has been in front of the cameras tonight. Oh, and why wouldn't he be? Big Niall has graced our TV screens for many years now, uh, during which time we've been privileged to witness. Yes, Steve. Welcome to the Orty evolution of Niall Quinn, capturing some of his greatest ever appearances on the state broadcaster. Now, Niall's on-screen debut came when he appeared at the Community Games as a 12-year-old in 1979. He's going for a three in a row in the Puck Father tournament, and no doubt spurred into action by Niall's burgeoning reputation, his opponent spared no expense on the kit front, like this Kerry lad who's actually wearing a pair of dress shoes instead of boots, I'm afraid. Uh, you'll see this now. Oh, this poor little man. Uh, if, we, if the camera will pan out just now. Here he goes. Ah, look at him there. No <laughs> Come on. Here's Don sporting a dashing look, and I can't help but feel I've seen this haircut somewhere before. <laughs> yeah. That is, that is kind of weird. Uh, anyway, uh, back to the action and uh, the kits. This little fellow appears to be wearing a vest with a crude, barely legible male stuck on the front. Uh, he's given That's that a right. fair old whack, though, jersey or none. Uh, okay, he's just dropped just short of the leader there. Uh, anyway. There's Niall Quinn. Here he okay, goes. So, some support, please, from everyone here in the audience. <laughs> Rick Pops, Niall Quinn. So, uh, there he is. It's a Dublin singlet, I believe he That's has nice there. Form, yep. uh, he bends, he oh. lifts, he strikes. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's an awesome slide for her. You see the immaculately dressed adjudicator here, actually in danger of running out of tape measure, uh, <laughs> such is the power of young Quinny. Uh, the puck fall at three in a row. Effortless, effortlessly confirmed for the young man with the big future <laughs> the big, big hair. Uh, but if you want to head the ball, looking like Liam Gallagher, is it really going to help you now, is it? So <laughs> Quinny's mantra uh, from, is to decrease your hair and increase your goals. So we skip forward to 1996 and the grip with Ryle Nugent. Uh, so a lesson <laughs> on how to head the ball. Uh, who here wants to head the ball like Niall Quinn? Anyone want to learn this? Okay. Two steps. One, show goalkeeper Ryle Nugent no mercy whatsoever. And two, Use the word boo a lot. <laughs> Nothing else. Your arms sometimes to give you balance, and it's just boom. <laughs> boom. Did you ever hear Paul McGraw when he had the ball? You can hear him up in the, in the top row of the terraces at Lansdowne Road. He goes, <laughs> and he heads it out. So, is that the type of power and aggression we're going to have? 
Boom. What is my body in a straight back, okay? I'm not going to be all over the place and heading it down here. I'm going to be ready to go. Boom. Okay? And if I don't do it, you can give out to me, all right? Okay, let's go. Boom. Keep reading and try to read it. Come on, last one. Oh, we didn't read that one now, did he? Boom. See the difference? Is your forehead actually made of concrete? I mean, these headers are like they're being fired from a gun or something. It's ridiculous. Poor Niall there, he left broken and indeed facing the wrong way. Anyway, a round of applause for Niall and his concrete. <laughs> <laughs>